I am going to put a little quick poll out here just to see where you guys are at. It's going to be, uh, I think, did I, let's see. I want to have a, okay, it's only multiple choice or yes or no. Um, it would help if I could type correctly. Okay, so this is a poll just to see whether you've gone through 7.2 yet, because 7.2, um, which is about like solving that, having some experience with doing the elimination method and substitution method will help you understand what I'm going to do today. So um, that if you have not gone through it, that's fine. You can still watch. Um, it just uh, might be easier if you've seen those before, but that, there's no reason that you can't watch this and get some idea what's going on. So we've got two that say yes and one that says no. So and then we've got a no response. But it looks like most of you guys have gone through 7.2 already, which is great. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so 7.3 is multivariable linear systems. This is basically if you have things more than X and Y, if you start having three variables or four variables or more than that, which is what actually tends to happen in the real world. Most of the time in the real world, when you're solving systems, have many, many variables. Usually anything that you like involves data is usually tens of thousands of variables. And those are all systems that you're solving. So if you have heard about people that go into data analysis and data mining and all that, they're basically solving systems of equations. They're not always linear, but they're usually thousands of variables. And so we use computers to do all of that. And so week three, you're going to get a little preview of that with matrices which are usually done um, with computers, but we're going to go through doing it by hand with three variable systems this week so you can at least see how this works. I'm going to end my poll. And so 7.3 covers using back substitution to solve linear systems in row echelon form using Gaussian elimination to solve systems of linear equations, solving non-square systems of linear equations, and then using systems of linear equations in three or more variables to model and solve real life problems. So um, I'm really only going to be talking about the first two. The non-square systems, that um, you don't really need to know it for the applicant assignment at all, so I'm not even going to worry about that. And then the systems of linear equations that are like the models, I actually have a video on that. That is the video on modeling with systems. So that should be on the link with all the other videos. And that I do go over a problem on there that's very similar to the um, application assignment. So I strongly recommend watching that video before you turn in the assignment because that will help give you a help or a lot of help. But it's good to do this one first so you know how to solve these bigger sums and then move on to um, that section from here. So we're going to start with what is called row echelon form. Now if you watched my video that's labeled Gaussian elimination, then this is going to be familiar. That video is basically taking 7.3 and connecting it to week three. So it's sort of like, okay, here's things you learn in 7.3. Let's look at it, look at it in terms of matrices. This, what I'm doing here is like, let's not even think about week three stuff. Let's just look at what's in 7.3. So we have row echelon form. So this name comes from the word echelon, which I had to look up because I didn't really know the definition or how the definition connected to what we do. And that's because the definition I know is not a military definition. So it actually comes from the military definition where echelon is a formation of troops, ships, aircraft, vehicles, and parallel rows, rows with the end of each row projecting further than the one in front. 
that's where it gets its name. So you can see I've got the standard form of a system where everything is lined up X, Y, and Z, and it's just a block of equations. Row echelon form, you can see where the definition comes from because you've got the bottom row, which we label equation three, which is just Z equals a number. So all the capital letters are our constants, our, our numbers. Then the next row has Y and Z, and then the first one has all three variables. So um, that is what's called row echelon form. So each, var each equation has more, like if you start at the top, you have all of your variables, and then you remove one, and then you remove one coming down. So that's when we say row echelon form, that's what we mean. And so to solve things in row echelon form, we'll use uh, back substitution. So first, row echelon form specifically has no coefficient in front of the x, y, and z. Um, or you can think of it as one. So that's if you have a number in front of those variables, that's not row echelon form. So it has to have no constant in front of there, no coefficient. And that's because that is really easy to solve for these variables. And so you're basically, you're pl plugging one equation back into the other, hence the name back substitution. So you start with the bottom row. You take equation three, z equals whatever number, and then you replace it, you plug it into the equation above it where you have y and z, and then you can solve for y. Once you have y and z, you back substitute back into the top equation. So you're working from the bottom up when you're substituting in. And so that way you're finding x last. So it's like you're working backwards in a way. So this is easy enough to show with an example. So we're using back substitution to solve this system that is in row echelon form. So I have x minus 2y plus 2z equals 20. I'm going to call this equation 1. Then we have y minus z equals 8. So this will be equation 2. And then z equals negative 1, which is equation 3. And so what we do is we take equation 3 and plug it into equation 2. And I'm going to just 3 into 2. So I, I'm just using the numbers, a circle that was referring to the equation. So equation 2, I have y minus z, but z is negative 1. So I have y minus negative 1 equals 8. So now you're just solving for y. So we have y plus 1 equals 8. And then you subtract 1 from both sides, and you get y is equal to 7. So now we know x and y. So now we're going to plug. I uh, does not want to write. Let's try this again. There we go. Plug equation 3 and y equals 7 into equation 1. So equation 1, we have x minus 2y, so y is 7, then plus 2 times z, which is negative 1, equals 20. And so now you're just solving for x. So we have x minus 14 minus 2 equals 20, which is x minus 16 equals 20. So then I add 16 to both sides, and then we get x equals 36. And so now you have x, y, and z, and you can write your solution. And with three variables, we write these is it, as an ordered pair, x, comma, y, comma, z. So they're in alphabetical order. So this is 36, comma, 7, 
comma negative one. So we have a series of ordered pairs, or not a series of ordered pairs, it's a series of numbers, but it's an ordered pair where we have three numbers there written. So I would like to sort of graph this for you. Um, and so I'm going to pull up, now Desmos cannot graph more than two variables. It, it can only do X and Y. But there's GeoGebra, which can do 3D things. So uh, we want the 3D calculator here. And now I'm waiting for it to load. Okay. So when we have a system and we have three variables, we're looking at our answer in 3D space. So this is what it looks like. So um, the green and the red, those are the X and Y axes. And so I can rotate them. I really wish these were labeled, but um, those are X and Y. And then going up, the blue, that is the Z axis. I wonder if I can label. No, I don't really want the grid. Okay, it doesn't really, it doesn't allow me to label these. But that's what we're looking at. So X and Y are 2D, so those are the flat part. And then Z is coming out of the paper. That's, that's basically the 3D part, what makes it 3D. So I'm going to put our system here. We have three equations, and these are representing um, different things. So if you have an X and a Y and a Z, that's going to give you a flat surface. Um, and then if you have two variables, that gives you a line. And then one variable gives you a single point. So we're going to see when we put these into GeoGebra, we're going to see a flat surface, a line, and a point. And then our solution is where all of these intersect. So I'm going to bring this back up again. So first I'm going to type in equation one. I have x minus 2y plus 2z equals 20. And so that is a flat surface. This is this blue surface that you're seeing. So oh, I want to, so you can kind of rotate. You can see how it's a flat, it's like a, a flat surface as I'm rotating. And so we're getting up, that's called a plane. So we have a plane when we have three variables there. Now our second equation is y minus z equals eight. So we're gonna get a line here. We should. Um, like it is also graphing a flat surface. Y minus z equals eight. I'm not sure why it gave us another flat surface because that should be the equation of a line. That I'm a little confused here, but we'll see what happens. And we have z equals negative one. Okay, this is it's true. It's graphing these all differently. It's graphing these as if they're all flat surfaces, which is a little interesting, but that works. So we're looking for the intersection of these. And when I'm looking at the graph here, these are not intersecting. But if I zoom out, now you can kind of see where they're intersecting. So I'm zooming out. So it's treating them all like flat surfaces, which is just a quirk of this, um, this 3D grapher. So that's, that's all that is. But our solution is where these intersect. And so you can see it appears to be somewhere in this area, I'm trying to, I can't really show it, but I will graph our three variables. We have 36, 7, and negative 1. Oops, I pulled 1 and 7. Okay, there we go. And so it's plotting that ordered pair. So you can see that that's where it looks like all of these flat surfaces intersect. So I'm trying to kind of get you to see that. But you can see that from the, the top, you can see that two of the flat surfaces definitely go through that point. And then it's on the other flat surface as I rotate. You can see that it's on the horizontal surface that we're looking at right now. So that's the solution. It's where all three of these surfaces combine and 
intersect at one location. So this is a visual of basically what we just solved. You don't have to know this. I just wanted to give you some connection to what this looks like in the, um, when you're graphing it, or if you wanted to graph it, so you can visualize what does this ordered pair of three numbers actually means. And it's just because we have three variables, basically. And so our ordered pairs are expanding beyond just two numbers. Now they're three numbers because we have a 3D surface. Are there any questions? Um, either the graph or the solving. Okay. So um, if you guys have questions, of course, you can just interrupt me at any time, type something. So um, that most of the stuff of what we get is not actually in row echelon form. You can see row echelon form was really easy to solve. Most of the time, that's not how we're given systems. We are given systems in standard form where you have all of the variables. And then you have to do a lot of manipulation and you want to put it in row echelon form because then you have something that's really easy to solve. So to do that, there are three basic things that we can do. And these are allowable actions when you're solving systems. So the first thing you can do is interchange equations. What that means is that if you have them ordered one, two, three, you can just write them in a different order. That's all it means. So if you want the, the second equation to be your first equation, that's fine. Um, second thing we can do is multiply an equation by a non-zero constant. That's something that you do when you are using elimination. If you want to use the elimination, you usually have to multiply one or more equations by a number so that things cancel. And then the third thing you can do is add an equation to another equation. So we're already doing that with elimination. And then you are replacing an existing equation with a new one. So that's something that we don't normally do when we use elimination. But that is something that we are doing here, uh, or we will be doing. And this is just a way to keep track. It's, a, it's, a, it's because normally when you solve, you have tons of equations you can create, and it's hard to keep track of. So by replacing an existing equation with your new one, that helps keep things in order and it helps you keep track of things. So these three things are called row operations. They're operations that we do on rows. And so we've already done this when we solve by elimination, basically. We're not doing everything, but we've used these ideas already. So this brings us to Gaussian elimination. And so Gaussian elimination is an algorithm used to solve a system of linear equations. So you use your row operations and you use those to get your system in row echelon form. And then once you have that form, then you back substitute so that you can actually get the solutions. So you're basically, you're doing the elimination methods because those are the row operations. And then you're doing back substitution. That's your substitution method. So it's like here we're combining both of our systems, the methods we know for solving systems together. Now, normally, you use matrices to solve using Gaussian elimination. So my video on Gaussian elimination goes through how you would use matrices to do that. But we're technically not covering matrices this week. So this video is showing you how to do it without matrices. So that way you can see both ways. But most of the time, we use matrices instead of doing this all by hand. And that's mostly because it's a long process. And it's faster when you do them in matrices rather than trying to do it by hand with all these equations. So. I'm going to demonstrate this with this example. And um, I'm just doing one example because it is lengthy. And then I'm going to let you, you know, when you're doing the application assignment, most of the ones on the assignment only have two variables, so you don't really have to do this method too much. But I show this method again um, in my modeling uh, a variable or a equation. Let's see, do I show it in there? Actually, I may not actually demonstrate the method. But at least you'll see how it works here. 
And it's very similar to what you've done with two variables. So you'll see it's really not that different. And you can take the methods for two variables and use it with three variables without even worrying about row echelon form. So you don't have to use Gaussian elimination. If you don't like this process, that is fine. But I'm going to demonstrate this. So we have a system here of three equations. And so I'm going to label these as equations one, two, and three. And right now, this is not in row echelon form because we have two rows or we have three variables. And then we have row three, which has two. So row three is great. We want to have row three. We want to have a row with um, two variables. So our goal is to put it in row echelon form so that we can use back substitution. So our goal is to have x plus something y plus something z equals something. And then y plus something z equals something. And then z equals something. So that's our goal so that we can do the back substitution. Now, this is going to involve a lot of critical thinking, a lot of trying to decide which is the best way to do this. So first off, I see that equation 3 has y and z, but it's not in the right form because it has a number in front of y. So first off, I want the, um, the second row to have only y and z. So what we are going to do is interchange equations two and three. We're just going to put those in the opposite order. We're going to flip which one comes. So that way I have the right equation. Is I have my y and z equation in the middle where it's supposed to be. So that's my system here. The first row is unaffected. And then my second row is now 3y plus 4z equals 13. And then my last row is x minus 2y plus 4z equals 13. So I'm trying to form this little stair step. So um, these are each time now I have a new row 1, 2, and 3. Because I'm always going to refer to these as their order. So the rows are just, the equations are different. It's we're referring to the rows. So now I'm going to try to get my second row. I just want to have y. I don't want to have 3y. So I'm going to divide the second row, everything in the second row, by 3, which is the same as multiplying by 1 third. So I'm going to do that so that I can get it in the right form. So I want to divide 2. So that's a, the row 2 thing in row 2 by 3. So row 1 is unaffected. And now I'm going to get some fractions. So I'm actually I'm going to need some more space here. So 3y, when I divide that by 3, I get regular y. Then I get 4 thirds z equals 13 thirds. And then my third row stays the same, x minus 2y plus 4z equals 13. So right now, my row 1 is exactly the form that I want it to be. So I can, if I want my goal, I'm going to just fill in these blanks. So row 1 is the correct form, and now row 2 is the correct form. I have 4 thirds z, and I have 13 thirds. So now I need to get my third row to be z only and to get rid of the x and the y. So before I move on to that, before I start working with that, do you guys have any questions on how I made row two 
to be what it's supposed to be or why I did that or any, any questions for what we have so far. Okay. Well, now that I'm looking at this, because this is a process where you're, you know, you're looking at this and you're trying to think, okay, I want to get Z equals. Now that I'm looking at, I'm looking at one and three here. What I have for row one, I already have Z by itself. So it might actually be easier to have that equation be my last one. And because it doesn't matter what's in front of the Y and the Z for my first row. So I'm actually going to interchange equations one and three here because I think that will make it easier when I'm trying to get Z equals for the last row. Let's see. So, and you can do these multiple ways. This is part of the, the thinking process is that how you do these, it depends on where your brain goes and what you think is easiest. So I'm going to interchange one and three. And that's just so that that third row, I have Z by itself. I don't have a coefficient I have to worry about. Oops. So now my first row is X minus 2y plus 4z equals 13. My second row is staying the same. That's y plus 4 thirds z equals 13 thirds. And now my last row is x plus y plus z equals 5. And so this will actually make, I think this will make it easier for us to find Z by itself because we don't, we have fewer coefficients to worry about as well. So I'm gonna, oops, I wanted that to be blue. So back when I'm looking at the top where I have my goal, I'm gonna replace my coefficients there. Okay, so now we need to get Z equals in the last row. So the first thing I'm looking at, I say, okay, I need to eliminate X. And so this is where knowing the method of elimination helps. So I have equation one and equation three. I have X in both of these. So all I need is for one of them to have a negative X. And then when I add them together, the X's will eliminate. And so that will be one step to get rid of X and then my next step will be to get rid of Y. So we are going to do that process. So it doesn't matter which one you multiply negative one by, but I think because we have the right signs in equation three, we're gonna multiply equation one. So I'm gonna say negative one times equation one. I'm going to add this to equation three. And then I'm going to replace equation three, and this will become the third equation. So this is going to, we're going to be uh, multiplying and adding and then replacing. So we're doing sort of multiple steps here. So I'm going to first write down what I have. So equation one times negative one. So that gives me negative x plus 2y minus 4z equals negative 13. My stylus or the writing is a little delayed here. I'm going to add that to equation 3, which is x plus y plus z equals 5. Now I'm going to add these together. So negative x plus x is 0. I have 2y plus y. That gives me 3y. Negative 4z plus z. That's negative uh, 3z. And then 
negative 13 plus 5, um, that is negative 8. So we have 3y minus 3z equals negative 8. Okay, so that's actually going to become our equation 3. And now I got rid of the nice, you know, now my z doesn't have a nice coefficient anymore. So maybe it didn't matter whether I switched rows 1 and 3 because I ended up with something that now it has number in front of it anyway. But, you know, it's all, it's, th this is the whole process, is what do you think looks like the easy thing to do and try to make it look like you want it. And sometimes it comes out and you're like, oh, now it doesn't look like what I want, and you have to kind of massage it a little bit more. So there are multiple ways to solve these kind of things. There's multiple steps. It's all about, okay, what does your brain tell you? Maybe it looks like the nice logical step. So now this gives me a new system. So this is going to be my new equation 3. So I have x minus 2y plus 4z equals 13. I'm waiting for my writing to eventually show up. <laughs> and then my second row is y plus 4 thirds z equals 13 thirds. And then I have 3y minus 3z equals negative 8. So now I need to get that last row to have just z. So I need to eliminate the y um, from that equation. So when I'm looking at what I have here, if I take the middle equation and multiply it by negative 3, then I can eliminate my y's. So that, you know, I look at that, I'm like, oh, and I divided that by 3. That seems silly. But, you know, sometimes you don't do things in the most efficient order. It's all about, well, what sort of, you know, what is the process? There are multiple ways to do these. So I'm going to take that second equation and multiply it by negative 3, and then I'm going to add it to the third equation, and then I'm going to replace equation 3 with the solution there. So I'm uh, moving on to here. So actually, so far, I'm going to just write what we have so far. We have, I need to go back to my other slide to remember. <laughs> okay x minus 2y plus 4z equals 13. We have y plus 4 thirds z equals 13 thirds. And then we have 3y, what do I have? Minus 3z equals negative 8. So that's what we have so far. So I'm going to take oops, negative 3 and multiply it by equation 2. And then I'm going to add that to equation 3. And we are going to replace equation 3 with that result. So that is going to become the new equation 3. So I'm going to start by multiplying equation 2 by negative 3. So that gives me a negative 3y. Then I get a minus 4z, and it equals negative 13. So luckily, by multiplying by negative 3, the fractions disappeared. Then equation 3 is 3y minus 3z equals negative 8. So now we're going to add those together. So negative 3y plus 3y is 0. Negative 4z minus 3z is 7z. Negative 13 minus 8 is negative 21. So this would become your new equation 3. Now at this point, it's just easy enough to solve for z. So let's just divide both sides by 7, and we get z equals negative 3. So now I'm going to just write this up here. We have a row echelon form. We have x minus 2y plus 4z equals 13. We have y plus 4 thirds z equals 13 thirds. 
and then we have z equals negative 3. Okay, so I see there's a question. Would it be negative? Yep, negative 7, z, you're right. I missed my negative sign. Good catch. It's a negative 7, negative 7, that's a positive 3. So this is part of the problem is you have to be very careful. It's a long process. And if you make one mistake there with, with, an, with a negative sign, then the whole thing's off. So thank you for catching that. OK, so are there any questions so far other than catching my mistakes, which thank you so much for catching that. Are there any questions with how we got our row echelon form? Okay, so I don't see any questions on the row echelon form. So now that we have our row echelon form, now we can back substitute. So I'm going to just do this in a different color. And so I'm going to take equation 3 and plug it into equation 2. So z equals 3. So I'm going to take z equals 3 and plug it in. Maybe I shouldn't use 0. I'm going to just write into equation 2. So we have y plus 4 thirds times 3 equals 13 thirds. I tried to find equations that are a system that wouldn't deal with fractions, but it's very hard to come up with a system. And most of the time, they do end up with fractions. So it was very hard. It took too much time for me to try find one that came out nicely. So because I know I have 13 thirds and that's not going to reduce, instead of canceling out the threes here, I'm going to keep it over thirds so that I can um, make sure everything comes out. Oops, not an equal sign. But that way I don't have to get a common denominator. So 4 thirds times 3 is 12 thirds equals 13 thirds. And so I'm going to subtract 12 thirds from each other. And we get y is equal to one third. So now I have z is three, y is one third. So now we're going to put these into equation one. So we have z equals three, y equals one third into equation one. So we have x minus 2 times y, which is 1 third, plus 4 times z, which is 3, equals 13. So that is x minus 2 thirds plus 12 equals 13. Now, I don't want to, I'm going to try to, I'm going to subtract the 12 from both sides so I can deal with the fraction last, just because it's easier to try to, you know, do the easy stuff first and then deal with fractions. So I'm going to just subtract the 12 from both sides. That gives me x minus 2 thirds equals 1, because 13 minus 12 is 1. So now I can add 2 thirds to both sides. And this is a lot easier to do in my head. So we get x is equal to 1 and 2 thirds, which as an improper fraction is 5 thirds. So now I have my solution. It's 5 thirds, 1 third, and 3. Are there any questions? Now you can check your answer by plugging those into your original system. 
Um, I like to check my answer by graphing. So I'm going to pull up the 3D graph again. And then I'm going to put in my three equations. So you can turn these off by hitting these little circles. And then um, I'm going to just delete that. OK, so our first equation, I need to put this back up so I remember <laughs> what our original system was. So we have x plus y plus z equals 5. OK, x plus y plus z equals 5. OK, so that gives me my first sort of flat surface. So you can see where that is. Second one, x minus 2y plus 4z equals 13. Oops, that did not type. Let's try this again. x minus 2y plus 4z equals 13. Not 33. Okay, so now you can see that that is intersecting with our other flat surface. So you can kind of move it around and kind of see where those are intersecting. I wonder if I could change these colors. Don't know how to do that. Um, it'd be nice, but it does make it so much easier for me to figure out. I don't know how to change these colors. Okay, and then the last one we had was 3y plus 4z equals 13. Okay, so now we have three flat surfaces here, and we're looking for the intersection. And so you can see that it looks like okay, we have we kind of kind of see where it might be. It's always hard to see when you're looking 3D and they're not different colors. So I'm going to plot our order pair that we had. 5 thirds, 1 third, and 3. And OK, so now you can see the dot. And you can see, OK, you can kind of rotate to make sure that it looks like that's where all three parts intersect. and as I move it, it does exactly like that is the intersection point. You can view in different areas and verify that things are intersecting. But you can see, OK, so that's where all three of these flat surfaces combine. So that is our solution. So you can see that this is a lengthy process. It's really easy to get lost. That's why I will everything that I've done to help me keep track. Uh, color coding might be something that works for you. You might you want to find a method that works so that you can follow what you did. And then it's a little easier to find mistakes as well. So it's, it's a lengthy process. This is partly why we use computers um, once they start getting this big, especially if you have like four variables, because it takes a long time. So. There are basically three different types of systems. So the ones that we found where there's one solution, which is the intersection point, is called an independent solution because each equation is independent of the other. It is possible to have systems with no solutions. So those are called inconsistent. So you can see these are two visualizations. Where you could have them all intersecting, but they don't intersect all at the same place. Or they could be all flat surfaces that are parallel, because then there's no intersection at all. You can also have dependent solutions. So a dependent would be all of the equations depend on each other, and that gives you infinite solutions. You can get a solution that's a line. So that is this second picture where this, the intersect here, it's not a point. It's actually an equation of a line where their intersect section is. Or your solution could be a plane where the all three equations are basically identical, just with different, they're just multiplied by a different constant. But they are the same flat surface, which then means they're intersecting ever because all you have is one flat surface. So those are the different types of solutions that you can have. And then they have special names for each of these. And when you have a dependent solution where your solution is a line, um, they, one example of writing this would be like x, and then the equation of a line, and then I think the third point is 0. Or if you have a plane, 
it's usually like y and then the equation is one way to write your solutions. Um, the textbook go goes over that and how you write them as ordered pairs. I generally don't write my solutions into ordered pairs for infinite solutions. I use braces. So like for a line, I'll say at some point x and y with the equation. Whoops. Or if it's a plane, I'll say it's x, y, z. And then I'll give the equation with the x, y, z in there. So that's usually how I write the solutions. But um, for everything on the application assignment, you're going to get one solution. So you don't need to really worry about that too much. So um, as I mentioned before, if you, you know, I have an example where I connect this to matrices, which is week three. So I have the link here directly to it. It's also in the classroom. It's not on YouTube. I haven't put that one up on YouTube. But if you do want to see how this connects to week three, I got a little head start on week three. Uh, you can watch that video and you can see how we do it with matrices. So are there any questions? Okay, so Brianda, you don't have any questions. How about anyone else? If you want to check your work, um, let me get that back up again. A good place to check your work uh, is Wolfram Alpha. So it's wolframalpha.com. And you can't get step by step solutions unless you pay, but it can solve systems of equations. And so you can at least check your work. And then it also provides a visualization. So um, let's see if they have any examples here. OK, they don't have an example of a system. But if I go back, usually they have examples. And then you can just click on one of these. But I would type up in this box solve, and then you can type your equations. So I'm going to just make something up. x plus 5, y minus z equals 10, comma, let's say we have 2x minus 4y equals 3, and then let's have 6x minus 10y plus 5z equals 11. I'm just totally making these up. It's probably going to be really nasty. Yes, <laughs> nasty fractions. But you can check your answer by typing it into Wolfram Alpha. You basically just solve and then type your equations with commas, and then it will give you your results. So that will give you a way to check your work. Now, on the assignment, the application assignment, I do need to see the work. So you do need to show me the process for some. But at least you can use this to double check whether you solved correctly before turning something in. But you generally can't see a step by step solution. Oh, this one is actually given. No, you gotta, yeah, you gotta pay. <laughs> like, I thought, oh, maybe they'll actually solve, solve it. But um, they're using Gaussian elimination because I can, I can tell because it says subtract one third equation one from equation two. So um, that would be the step by step. But for free, you don't get that. But at least you can check your work and get the exact values. So Wolfram Alpha is a great place. I'm actually surprised it didn't give a graph. I wonder if I just type graph here, if it'll put those all in the same graph. No. What happens if I just leave off the word? Oh, it's just giving you different ways to write it. So sometimes it will give you a graph, sometimes it won't. But at least you have your solution to double check. So uh, since there's no other questions, that's all I had. I knew that I would only really have time to go through one example because this is um, time consuming. 
on the application assignment, I think there's only one question where you actually have three variables that you need to solve. The rest are all should be all two variables. So that will make your life a lot easier. Um, so yeah, that's all I've got for you guys. If you have questions, of course, you can reach out. Um, our next live is going to be at 7 p.m. Let me double check. I think it's 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Yes. So, you know, I said I was going to give you guys a chance to have an evening for the introduction. So I'm going to go through the introduction of week three at 7 p.m. I'm going to be talking about the different matrices and or the different technology you can use to solve with matrices. Because I do allow you to use technology to do so, because you can see how long it took just to do one of these by hand. Um, and then I'll talk about how you need to show your work for that on the application assignment. So that way um, you get full points. So that one's, if you can attend at seven o'clock, that it would be great. If not, you know, you can watch the recording and um, see what you missed. So, all right, that's all I've got for you guys. So I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Um, and I will talk to you guys later. <laughs> all right, bye.